Here is nickel knowledge for December 27th, 2020. In 1850, Hawaiian Fire Department was established. And in 1904, Peter Pan premieres at Duke of New York Theater in London. In, eight, in 1939, American ski, mobile, ski mobiles nor, yeah, on 1847, first Howdy Do show tel was telecast on NBC. Euler, Euler, in 1981, Euler, Wayne Britsky, becomes fastest NL NLHer to get 100 points, 38th game.
Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome. Here we are, just two days removed from Christmas, and it's an exciting time. I hope that you got everything that you wished for. I know certainly I did, and I'm very grateful for the presents that I got. And one of the greatest presents that we had was we got to spend it together as a family, yeah, which is always nice. This morning, we're going to be talking about what are we to be when it says we are to be the salt of and this morning's message takes from a lot of different aspects. Um, probably one of the things that you're going to notice this morning is we're going to have uh, a flavorful kind of day, if you will. So with that said, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to gather this morning virtually. And Lord, we just ask that the Holy Spirit speaks to the hearts of those listening this morning. And Lord, we just ask that uh, we be the salt and light that you ask us to be, as it says here in Matthew. In Jesus' name, amen. See, this morning we're going to be talking about salt and light, but on Sunday, in April 8th of uh, 1945, a German pastor named Dietrich Bonhoeffer was taken from a worship service they just conducted for our prisoners and uh, a concentration camp in philosopher. And he he was tried for treason and hanged just a couple of weeks before the Allied forces liberated the uh, prison camp. A doctor at the scene described Bonhoeffer's final moments as this. He said, Through the half-open door in one of the huts, I saw Pastor Bonhoeffer. Before taking off his prison clothes, kneeling on the floor, praying fervently, to his God. I am most deeply moved by the way this lovable man prayed, so devout and so certain that God heard his prayer. At the place of execution, he again said a short prayer and then climbed the steps to the gallows, brave and composed. His death ensured after a few seconds, in the almost 50 years that I worked as a doctor, I have hardly ever seen a man die so submissively to the will of God. Bonhoeffer believed the words of Jesus, even to the point of death. You, Diedrich, are the salt of the earth, and you are the light of the world. When we accept those words, it may mean that we are called to do something which will lead us to persecution, which would lead us to ridicule, which lead, would lead us to difficult decisions. It means radical obedience to Jesus. It means we should make a difference for Jesus. And if you believe those words of Jesus, then you are being the salt and light to this world. In order to best answer the question, let's take a look at what Jesus meant when he told his disciples and us, we are to be salt and light. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. Let me read them for you. It says, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. The city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Salt adds flavor. To whatever it touches. In fact, most of us don't even think about salt unless we're on a salt-free or low-sodium diet. But who wants to eat saltless potato chips? Who wants to eat saltless pretzels? Even a little salt on french fries or potatoes. And to the benefit of those who can't have salt, there's items that we can buy that taste like salt but certainly 
certainly don't contain any. A Christian who is the salt of the earth gives taste to a world that is sinful, bland, and without joy. Christians who influence this world give taste to a tasteless world. We add divine flavor. Salt creates thirst. If you eat salty food, you get thirsty. If you go to a Chinese buffet, they intentionally make you the, make the food salty so you can drink more, and it, which fills you up so you'll eat less. But that's not the case with me because I make it like a roulette, blackjack, and all you can eat buffet. I'm like, hit me again, hit me again. But have you ever had a bland buffet? Generally speaking, people who are described as salty are usually considered irritating, unpleasant, and angry. Most people don't really want to hang out with them, so we don't want to be described as this type of salty Christian. That will actually lead people away from Christ. But as salty Christians, we should create a thirst for God in those who don't know Him. A Christian should help People have the desires to drink from the living water of Christ. There should be something about Christians that is different from the world. What makes us different from the world? You sit there and you're like, I don't know. I don't know. I'll tell you what makes us different because of our walk. See, anybody can have a head knowledge about Jesus Christ. Anybody can learn anything. That is what religion is. Religion is just learning about the rituals and going through the routine. The authentic gospel of Jesus Christ is that you have not a head knowledge, but a heart knowledge. You're living it out day in, day out. When the good is good, you praise Jesus. When the bad is going to the toilet, you praise Jesus anyway. Because you live your life to the fullest for God. You have that relationship. Now, some of you this morning are watching, and you may have a spouse, or if you have a boyfriend or girlfriend, let's say. When you're in that relationship, you are committed to that relationship. You are intimate in that relationship. You are into it to the point where you want to know everything that you can about the other person. That's the way the relationship we should have with Jesus this morning, in every single day. There was a famous minister from Westminster Chapel in London that told about a conversation he had with a man who had invited a co-worker to church. He told the pastor that they worked together for five years and never knew the other was a believer in Christ. The man thought it was funny, but to his surprise, the pastor exclaimed, Funny? No, it isn't funny at all. You both need to be born again. You see, it was inconceivable to the pastor that two men could be Christian, work side by side, and not aware that the other uh, were brothers in Christ. So my question to you this morning is this. Do the people around you know that you're a follower of Christ? Do they see it in your actions? Do they see it in your words? Now, I know that this, those are three questions that a lot of people are sitting there going, eee, cringing this morning. Okay, but they're true. This is why. If you're a coach, and coaching kids, you're never going to curse. You may raise your voice to get someone's attention. Uh, you may also put your arm around them to talk to them, to find a reason to praise them. But you're never going to curse at them. And you have people that are on the team, some, you have some coaches that will you know, call kids names, he's not the best player, whatever. But you're able to spot things in other people. And you can tell those kids encouraging by the way of how they act to one another. You need to be the example in that situation. Okay? And if a kid strikes out, guess what? He strikes out. This summer, Brady and Brody had the privilege of playing baseball. And when they strike out, they get so hard on themselves. And the other kids on the team are depending on them to get on base so they can get back up there and get a hit 
And everybody wants to be the winner. Everybody wants to hit the home run ball. But when they strike out, what happens? They feel deflated. They feel like they let everybody down. But I love one of the kids' coaches uh, they have, Coach Gabe and Coach Kennedy. They come up to the kids and they're like, you know what? That's all right. Next time, buddy. Next time. We get it next time. They're an encouragement to the kids. We need to be that same way as Christians to other Christians and to others that don't know Christ. We need to be that encouragement. We need to be that coach, the positive coach that says, all right, buddy, that's okay. But how can we show the world, even in subtle ways, that we are followers of Christ? We can't be silent about who we are in Christ. We are physical representations of Jesus. And if the world does not know we are Christ followers, why is that? I'll tell you why. It's because we're not sharing God. We're only giving God one hour of the week. We come to church in the morning, we feel all up. You want me, you want the pastor and sit up there? And be like, man, let's go today, you know, motivational speaking time. But it's not always like that. Sometimes the Lord will lay subjects on our hearts, and we preach on them, and they convict people. It meets them right where they're at. See, George Barner's research has shown that the average Christian in the average church is almost indistinguishable from the rest of society. He is referring to the fundamental moral and ethical difference that Christ can make in how we live. That is why he wrote, when Christian teens get pregnant and do drugs at the same rate as the general teenage population, when our marriages end in divorce at the same rate as the rest of society, when we cheat, lie, steal, and commit adultery at the same statistical level as those who say they are not Christians, then something is wrong. If you're a Christian, make what makes your life different than other non-Christians? Philip Yancey asked the question, if you're a non-believer, came to you and asked you how your life as a Christian differs from theirs as a moral non-Christian, what would you tell them? Seriously, what would you tell them? Our lives must make a distinguishable difference in the lives of others. Not just through our morality, but through our spirituality. Our life in Christ must be driven morally and, and our, through our morality and our ethics. Our life in Christ must drive our morality and ethics. It must drive everything about us. If it does not, what does it say about who Christ is in your life? Are you just a guy in the driver's seat and you have Christ in the back seat and pop out of the station wagon? like it was with me growing up with the kids. My mom and dad being in the front, I'm in the way back of the station wagon with the dog. Is that the way you look at your Christianity? As a Christian, you have an opportunity to accept God's gift of salvation, love, hope, joy, and peace. We're called to be the salt of the earth. We're called to season the world with the flavor of grace. We're called to bring healing. We're called to lead people to become thirsty for Jesus. And we've all known that we can demonstrate God's gift of joy, love, and peace, even in the worst moments. And we ask, why are you like this? Why? Well, what we don't always realize is that God may be using them as a means to make people thirsty for Christ. Through your life, you can make people thirsty in their hearts. What I love about being around other Christians that are on fire for Christ is that they fan the flame, so to speak. I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, and it's like a fire. You have a nice raging fire. Every now and then you throw some gas on it to get it to flare up, but then you have the embers down at the bottom. But what do you got to do with the embers? You got to stir them, and when you stir them, the fire reignites without something. You don't need to have a substitute to help reignite the flames. All you have to do is stir it up and do a little work. That's the same way we are. We just have to do a little work. And listen, if you're watching this morning and you feel like you're, you're trying to find the answers for Christ, 
please, please email me. I love to talk to you. I love to help lead you through where those answers are. Because we all feel like that sometimes. We all do. When, when Pastor Mubar passed away, I asked myself the very same question. Why, God? Why? Why did you take my mentor? Why did you? Why did you take the man that was my life that was helping me guide me through this uh, path? And he just sat there and said, "I've always been there for you. I've always got your back." And then now, where we are, the people that knew Pastor Mubar have said, "You know, he'd be so proud of us. Be proud of our church family to see how we've come so far." Salt acted like a preservative in Jesus' day. There were no refrigerators, so there was no need. So they needed salt to meet, you know, so the meats wouldn't spoil. Rubbing salt all over the meats acted as a preservative, and the meat would last for a long time without spoiling. Salt has a preserving effect on meat, and Christians should have a preserving effect in our world. When Christians express their faith, through their lifestyle, society cannot help but be changed. See, right now we have all these, you know, we have so many Christians in the world, and it's all now this person's, I'm on this person's side or this person's side. It's not about your loyalty with man. It's about your loyalty to God. You have to be an ambassador of Jesus Christ. Jesus tells us to follow him. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody can get us into heaven except through him. Salt was used on wounds to bring healing, and we are to be healers. Our calling is to walk alongside one another when we are hurting. We are there to solve their problems. We're not supposed to do their work. We're not supposed to do it so they can feel better. We're instead, we are supposed to uh, walk with them, sit with them. We cry with them, we hold them, we care for one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. And as a pastor, I'm in beyond the privilege to walk with so many people in the darkest and worst moments of their life. And it's no fun, really. It's no fun to be people with who are struggling with loss, grief, death, and separation. But when we see the hand of God, the presence of God at work, we see the joy of life still being present, even in the midst of trauma and tragedy. And yes, that makes it all worth it. Part of our calling is to help as a preserving influence on our society, to preserve the world from decaying to the effects of sin. You know when salt loses its saltiness, it's good for nothing. Nothing like eating a chip that has lost its saltiness. That's bad. Not quite as bad as eating, you know, as my wife would say, celery. But not only are we to be the salt of the earth, but we are also to be the light to the world. We are to be a visible influence of Jesus Christ. Salt is a hidden but powerful influence. Light is visible. In revealing influence. Jesus calls us to make a visible impact on the world around us. How do we do that? Jesus said that we need to make the light visible as to as many as possible by refusing to allow it to be hidden, but rather positioning it so our light shines on everyone around us. Light reveals things as they really are. When you turn on the light, every little light begins to destroy the darkness. Light reveals what is hidden. If you're in the major cities, you go into some of those old tenements down there, you turn on the lights, the light exposes all the bugs, and the bugs start to go away because they don't like the light. The cockroaches just go, Phew, see ya. That's why people want to have lights on all the time down there. That's why I would. But light also gives life. What happens when the sunlight has gone down? What happens... In Revelation, when the sun is hidden, the world becomes colder, plants will not grow, living things need light to live, and God created light to give life. 
When we allow light, our light in Christ, to shine before others, other people see our good works, and they will also see God in us. God, who is the source of our light, our good works don't save people. But God uses those deeds to help save people. This morning, uh, on Friday morning, the church did something that was an act of kindness. We teamed up with Keep Believing Ministries with Dr. Ray Pritchard. And we asked if he sent us a hundred copies of his book, An Anchor for My Soul. And we had people from our church make labels, and we wrapped every individual gift of those books up to be distributed to the Warren County Jail System down in Lake George. Because we believe in the power of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that just one good act may be a difference in somebody's life. There are currently 94 inmates down in the jail right now. But you know what? By that kind gesture that we did, and if they open up that book and read it, maybe they'll like maybe there's the embers that are still in their heart because of what they did wrong. They they went off the beaten path and now they're paying their dues for it. But maybe because of that book, it will take those embers and start a fire within them that want to pick up this book, the Bible, which is our game plan for life, which is our handbook for life. And they'll see it, and then they can go through a life transformation of what they once were to what they could be. They can go through a restoration process. Dr. Pritchard, on his website, gave a story of how a prisoner in California was contemplating committing suicide, ending his life. And then one day, one of his books was thrown under the jail cell. He looked at it and thought about it, and he's like, nah, he kept it. But then he picked up the book and started reading. And then he read it more and more. And he sent a type written letter to them saying, thank you for writing this book. I want you to know that I have now accepted Christ as my Savior. How awesome is that, that one book? But the amazing thing was this, that Dr. Richard said, is that they didn't send that book at all in that part of California. So somebody had the notion to grab that book and give it to slide it under that inmate's wall. We have a person in our church that's a former prison guard uh, officer, and she's always said that, you know, God puts people in there, and you know, and they would slip things underneath at times. God knows what people need and when they need it. God, you know, our good works doesn't save people, but God uses those deeds to save people. Woodrow Wilson, who was the president of the United States at the time, told the following story. He said, I was sitting in a barber chair when I became aware that a powerful personality had entered the room. A man had come in to have his hair cut, and he sat in the chair next to me. Every word the man uttered, though it was not in the least, you know, uh, kosher, showed a personal interest in the man serving. And before I got through with my haircut, I was aware that I had attended an evangelistic service because D.L. Moody was in that chair next to me. I purposely lingered in the room after he left After he left, and noted the singular effect that his visit had brought upon the barber chair. They talked in undertones. They did not know his name, but they knew something had elevated their thoughts. And I felt that I I left that place as I should have left a place of worship. Our lives should reflect something more than the world has because we have more than they have. We have Jesus. He has forgiven us. He saved us. He changed our hearts. He's given us hope. He put his love in us. He's given us joy. And set our feet on the rock, which can never be shaken. It does, he, if he doesn't make a difference in your life, then do you really know Jesus? If not, come and meet him. 
And if you have lost him as your first love, then come and be reacquainted with him. I was talking to one of my high school friends from back home in Vermont this week, and there was seemed to be a lot of stuff going on in her life. And I was just like, you know, God's got this under control. And she was telling me about how when she was in North Carolina, that they found Jesus. They found an authentic church, an authentic disciple-making, Bible-believing church, and that poured into them. And they feel so connected there. And that's what we need. We need to have that connection. It's okay to go to, people go to church just to say they go to church. To make it off their checklist. But you can't do that. You need to be part of the church. You need to be part of the church family. So when things happen, when you get shaken to your core, you have other people there to help build you up. To help hold your hand and say, you know what, it's okay. We're going to get through this together. And they'll sit there and they'll pray with you. My family is not the greatest family in the entire world. We have our ups and our downs. But the core foundation of our relationship is centered on our Savior. We know that our Savior is going to get us through this. We need to lean on Him. And it's not like, well, we can't always lean on Him. Yes, we can. We can always lean on Him. Because he will never fail us. Man fails us. God never fails us. Our lives should reflect something more than the world has. Jesus said that we are to let our light shine before people in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify God. There you go. There must be an intentionality to letting our light shine. We must determine to do things that will bring honor and glory to God. We don't do them to find salvation. That is already ours for the asking. We do good works because that is part of the reason we were created, as it says in Ephesians 2.10. When people see that we care because we are people who know God, they will more clearly see God. The light of Christ, which is in us, will shine upon them. Our light is displayed in our behavior, and the depth of your spiritual commitment will be measured by your behavior. How do you act? What do you do? How you behave will be the measuring stick people use to determine your relationship with Christ. If you are filled with light, then your whole life will be radiant, as though a floodlight is shining on you. On the other hand, it doesn't seem, or it doesn't matter how much you strongly announce that you're a light, if you're not shining, you won't be believed. Nowhere are the words truer that says, what you are doing speaks so loud, I can't hear what you are saying. In other words, if you're going out there saying, I am a believer in Christ. I believe Jesus Christ. And yet, when you're in your little circle, away from your church circle, you're in your little old circle, and you sit there and you start talking like a drunken sailor and make him blush, that's not appropriate. And people will just say, yep, same old, same old. Never going to change. That's when we get called hypocrites. When we hear about Christian leaders who are, who are embroiled, in sin. Whatever it is, it leaves a bad taste on the world. It opens the door for the world to stay away from the very person that they need the most, which is Jesus. When churches fight amongst themselves, what type of witness is that to the world? We may think that we what we do is a private matter, but it's really not. When we follow Jesus, we live in that fishbowl. Others will see how we act. They will see if we're really salt and light. They will know it by our actions. You know that old campfire song, they'll know we are Christians by our love. They will because our love is demonstrated through our actions. When we were up at the Bible Institute, we always used to have a saying that you can only think it for so long until you can make it. Because the kids would come and they'd be on fire for camp crew or whatever it is during summer ministry. They want to live their life. And it was a new opportunity for them. And 
They really didn't have to try really hard. They could be whoever they wanted to be because nobody really knew who they were. That would last about two weeks and then their sinful nature would start to come to the top. And, you know, there were some instances we had where we had to dismiss some kids because they were affecting the entire body. We can't do that in our society. We can't dismiss everybody. So we have to learn how to deal with that. And one of the things is dealing with it is showing them Christ's love. Showing them the love of Jesus Christ. Showing them that, you know what, what you're doing is not acceptable, but let me show you how you can change. There is hope for you to change. Because so many people feel like they can't get anywhere. People are watching how we live. And when we blow it, we are blowing it out of our life. It's like little Jackson last week after church, Eric was in, when we had all the candles lit. And once I said, Amen, you're dismissed, he comes running up and he, he's so quick to blow out all the candles. We should always be seeking to live our lives according to the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. While we are far from perfect, our goal should always be to make those fruits visible. When we do, we are the salt of the earth and a light to the world. Maybe you've been living a life that is at odds with the message of Christ, or maybe you've been acting in an unloving manner towards others. What do you do? Well, light the torch again, because it's gone. How does it mean it has to stay out? We can change, we can't change the past, but John, 1 John 1 9 reminds us of God's grace when he says, But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from every wrong. Your sins can't be undone, only forgiven. John Piper said, You're either a microscope or a telescope. When people see you, they don't they see a dinky little God who can be only seen under a microscope. Or do people see a holy, awesome, majestic God as if they were looking through a telescope? Let's shake and shine and be the salt and light of this world. Is the light of Christ being made visible in your life? Or has the light gone? Has the passion of God become religious, a ritual, and routine? Don't hide the light. Take it out and hold it high. We were not created to be secret disciples. We were created to be torchbearers for God. Torches which are held high. And is your life making a difference? Jesus said, be the salt and the light. If you live for him, it will go. It will. Go rob its shoulders with the world. Help others experience Christ. When we stick close together, we have more power to shine the light of Christ. We are different. We are salt and light. We may be telescopes when people see us, so that they may be seeing the magnificent, glorious, powerful, and awesome love of God. You may be sitting there this morning saying, it's so hard, I don't know. But listen, one of my favorite, favorite holiday movies is Santa Claus Coming to Town, the Claymation. And in there, there's a song. And when they, you know, Chris Kringle is talking to the Winter Warlock, and the Warlock says, it's so hard to be nice. He says, what? All you have to do is put one foot in front of the other. And away you will go. So this morning, I ask you this: Are you wanting to be salt and light? Do you are you going to listen to that voice that says you can't do it, or are you going to put one foot in front of the other, and away you go? If that's the choice you make, give me a call. I will go with you hand in hand. I will go into the trenches of the darkness and the battles of hell with you, so you do not feel alone. Thank you for watching this morning. Let us pray. Father God in heaven, we just thank you for your word. Thank you for being our light. Lord, I just ask that we continue to make a difference in our life. Lord, can we ask that you just continue to bless us and encourage us. And if somebody this morning hears this message, Lord, that they feel
feel comfortable enough to contact us or you can contact a friend or another person and just start that relationship because we are going to be disciple-making machines, Lord, and we will honor and glorify you until the day you come take us home. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week, everyone. God bless.